And Michael, I wondered if, and I, you're probably already going to do this, but if you could talk a little bit about uh, self-study like Shravana and contemplation, Manana, and the practice itself, uh, Minyasana, and how those relate to what we're saying and how we can incorporate it into our daily life. And um, I know this is quite a broad topic, and we can certainly carry it over to next month, too, and next month after that if we need to. But uh, anyhow, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to do with it as you wish. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, yes. Um, Bhagavan's teachings well, are all focused on practice. Because uh, in order to know ourselves, we need to investigate ourselves. So that is what Bhagavan's teachings are all about. And this small work, uh, Nana, Who Am I?, is a very important text in this context. Regarding Sravana, Manana, and Nidityasana, Sravana literally means hearing. Um, but uh, that's a metaphor for any type of uh, of study or uh, uh, that reading or um, um, listening or whatever. Um, so that's basically uh, studying the teachings um, in the context of of the path we are following. We're studying Bhagavan's teachings primarily. Manana means thinking deeply about them because merely reading is insufficient. We've got to understand what we read, and we understand what we read um, by thinking deeply about it, by understanding why Bhagavan says whatever he says, why he says it, what are the practical implications of what he says, and how it ties in with all the other things that he said. So um, we, we need to have a coherent uh, and clear understanding of his teachings in order to put it into practice. So that is what is called manana. And um, nidityasana literally means deep contemplation. In the context of Bhagavan's teachings, it means contemplating ourselves. In other words, turning our attention within um, to see what we actually are. In other words, self-investigation. What is most important is the actual practice of self-investigation. But the sravana and manana is a great aid to that. That is, Bhagavan's words, firstly, they're constantly encouraging us to turn within. And secondly, they how to turn within, how to put this into practice, cannot be exactly explained in words. Because as Bhagavan said, the way this is a, not an objective part, so it can't be explained objectively. So whatever Bhagavan has taught us, they are all pointers. So we need to understand those pointers clearly. To the extent we understand those pointers clearly, we'll be able to put them into practice. So it's very, very reading Bhagavan's teachings and understanding them clearly is important. But merely by reading and thinking about them, we uh, we won't get a deep understanding. The, the deep understanding comes primarily through practice. Um, that is, when we try to put it into practice, we see we, we come across difficulties and when we go back to, to reading what Bhagavan has said and we see what clues he's given us to deal with whatever obstacles or difficulties we face. Um, so the, the sravana and manana are supports for the nidityasana, for the actual practice, but the practice is what is most important. And why I say the real clarity comes from the practice The normal direction in which our mind goes is outwards. Outwards doesn't mean only out to the world. Towards anything other than ourselves is outwards. That is, we alone are within and everything else is outwards. So even our thoughts, our, our vasanas, that's our inclinations, our likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, thoughts, um, emotions, and so on. These are all external to ourselves. So attending to any of these things is facing outwards. These, so in other words, attending to any object or any phenomenon 
is facing outwards. And since all objects are relatively gross, I mean, some are grosser than others. Obviously, physical objects are most gross. They're grosser than the thoughts or the feelings in the mind. But even thoughts and feelings are relatively gross in comparison to what we are investigating, which is ourself. That is, everything else is objects. We are the subject. So we are trying to turn our attention away from objects back towards the subject. The subject is what Bhagavan calls ego. But the ego is a mixture. That is, ego, what we actually are, is just the pure awareness I am. That is the fundamental awareness, our fundamental awareness of our own existence. That is what we actually are. But now we don't experience ourselves just as I am. We experience ourselves as I am this person, I am this body, I am Michael or whoever. So this that pure awareness I am is mixed and conflated with adjuncts. Yeah, adjuncts being the the whole bundle that constitutes the person we take ourselves to be. That is what Bowman usually referred to as body. So he said, ego is nothing but a false awareness. I am this body. So, um, so ego is not the original light. Ego itself is not the original light. But within the ego, that original light is shining. The original light means that light of pure awareness. I am. So when we are investigating ourselves, it is the, as Bhagavan says in Maharshi's Gospel in one place, it is the essential chit aspect of ego that we're investigating. Chit means awareness. The essential awareness aspect of ego means the I am portion. We're not investigating the person we seem to be. We're investigating the, in that mixed awareness, I am this person. It's the I am, it's the fundamental awareness, I am, that we're investigating. So this is the original light. This is the light that illumines the mind, enabling the mind to know all other things. That is, um, light here is obviously used as a, as a metaphor, but um, one way it's explained is, that is, in order to see physical objects, we need physical light. But the mind is the light that sees that physical light, that is, that illumines that physical light. Because we can see whether it is whether the light is shining or whether it is dark, so we are able to see both the, the presence and absence of physical light. So, what illumines the presence and absence of physical light is the mind. But the mind itself is a light that appears and disappears. The mind appears in waking and dream; it disappears in sleep. So, it is not the original light. The original light. It's only that fundamental awareness I am, which is shining in all three states. So that is what we are trying to attend to. Since that is the original light, the more we attend to I am, the more our mind is, so to speak, bathed in clarity. So the more we put Bhagavan's teachings into practice, the deeper we go in the practice, the, the clearer his teachings will become. So... There are, there are relatively few essential texts that we have to read to, to understand Bhagavan's teachings correctly. One of them is this work, of Nana, Who Am I? Um, two other very important works are Uludu Napdu, the 40 verses on what is, and Upadesha India, which is a collection of 30 verses. Um, these are these are the three texts in which Bhagavan has most systematically um, explain the fundamental principles of his teachings. But there are other important writings, that all Bhagavan's original writings are very important, and they all, all are pointing in the same direction. That is another group of his writings is Arunachala Stutipanchvam, or Five Hymns to Arunachala. That also, it's all pointing in the same direction, to turning our attention within, to, to investigate and see what we actually are. Though it is written in the form of devotional hymns, this is all beca because when we, when we are trying to turn within, because of the strength of our inclination to go outwards, we all have difficulty turning within. We find the mind keeps on trying to jump out again. So... Uh, we feel we need support, and that support, 
there's devotion, that is the devotion to guru uh, is, is a very important support in this, in this path of self-investigation. For Bhagavan, his guru was Aranaksha, a form of the hill. Um, so, and Bhagavan is our guru, so Aranaksha is our guru's guru, so it's also our guru. So um, that devotion that Bhagavan had to Aranaksha in so many ways, in our natural shoot Stuti Panchum, Bhagavan is, is giving us practical guidance on following this path. And this path, as Bhagavan often said, it's not just the path of self-investigation, it's the path of self-surrender. Because by investigating what we are, we are thereby surrendering this ego. Uh, so all of Bhagavan's original writings, which are relatively few in number, that is, our natural Stuti Panchum is just um, five hymns, and then Upadesh um, Undia, Uldunapadu, and there are a few other small works. That, uh, that is, there's a supplement to Uldunapadu called Uldunapadu Anabandam. There's a collection of five hymns called uh, Ekatma Panchakam. Uh, there's another collection of five songs called, um, sorry, did I say five hymns? I meant five, five verses called Ekatma Panchakam. Another collection of five verses called Atma Vidya. That's the song on the science of self which Bhagavan says, this path is the easiest of all paths. Um, there's also a song that he wrote for his mother. Uh, it is um, when she wanted him to help her make apalam. Apalam is, um, you, you maybe know it from, if you've eaten Indian food, it's sometimes called popadom or apalam. Or, I mean, it's, it's got slightly different names in different languages, but it's basically, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fried, it's a, it's a flat um, uh, uh, pancake type thing made of um, gram flour, which is fried in oil or heated over a fire. So uh, when she asked him to make that, he wrote a song using that as a, uh, all the ingredients as analogy to explain this part of, um, this part of uh, jnana. Um, so that's, that's basically, that's all of Bhagavan, and there are a few stray verses, in all, there are about 27 instructive verses, which Sadhuam collected together as a work called Upadesha Tani Parker. These are all the original poetic works of Bhagavan. The important uh, original writing of Bhagavan in prose is this work, Who Am I? So this is all the essential things that we, we need to understand. If we understand these, and, and particularly, as I say, these three, Nana, who am I, Uludunapanu, Pitesh, India, if we understand these, we get a clear understanding of Bhagavan's teachings. And as we go deeper in the path, we will find all the help and guidance we need are provided in these works. And, of course, our natural student is also very important. So, um, I can say from my, okay, I've been studying these works now for, about 45 years, but I'm still learning from them. I'm not learning new information, but I'm, uh, uh, the depth of meaning in them becomes more and more clear as we follow this, as we, as we go deeper and deeper in following this path. So um, this is the importance of what is called Sravana Manana Nidityasana. That is, the most important is the Niti Tiyasana, the Sravana and Manana are important supports, aids. That is, it's very important. In order to put it into practice, we first have to understand what it is we're practicing. This is a very, a very deep and subtle path, so we need to have a clear understanding. But even once we've understood what the practice is, or at least we've begun to understand what the practice is, we still need their help because they continue to encourage us and, and um, give us support in our efforts to turn within. So I think that's um, that's enough about um, Sravana Manana and Asana for the time being. Um, now I'll begin to talk about uh, Nana. Um, this was originally... Uh, um, in the very early days, when Bhagavan was about 20, 21, 22, uh, a devotee called Shiva Prashan Pillai came to Bhagavan, and um, the first question he asked Bhagavan was, who am I? And then he asked a series of questions. 
in those days, Bhagavan was um, was talking very little. So many of most of Bhagavan's replies, probably to the first few questions, when Shiv Kashmapalai asked him, Bhagavan replied simply by uh, writing on the sandy ground with his finger. Um, later on, Shiv Kashmapalai used to bring either a sl slate and chalk for Bhagavan to write his answers or a piece of paper and a pencil. So he noted down Bhagavan's replies and um, he kept these in various notebooks and he edited them in various ways for his own interest. And, but he, he didn't think of publishing them for many years. But in the early 1920s, um, some friends of his encouraged him to publish. He had written a biography of Bhagavan in Tamil verse called Arunachala. Uh, sorry, called Ramna Charita Ahava. And um, when that was first to be published, I think that was in 1923, um, it was decided that he, well, he decided to add, to include as an appendix uh, some of the questions and answers that Bhagavan, but some of the questions he had asked Bhagavan and the answers Bhagavan had given him. Um, so that was, in, at that time, it was just 25 questions and answers. Later, that came to be published as a separate booklet, which the most complete version was a version with 30 questions and answers, which I think was probably published around 1924-25. By 1926-27 or thereabout, Bhagavan rewrote the question and answers in the form of an essay. When he did so, he added a new paragraph at the beginning. He rearranged the ideas. He, he removed most of the questions, and he, he connected the ideas together in the form of a coherent exposition. But he also, in many places, he um, he refined what, what was there. He some th some ideas he omitted, some ideas he slightly modified the wording. So it, it, the principal version is this essay version, what was written by Bhagavan himself. Um, even after Bhagavan uh, wrote this essay version and it was published, people continued to like question and answer version. So for some years, the uh, 30 question and answer version continued to be published for at least uh, 10 years after that. But one, in, by about 1931, the ashram began their own publications. That it was only from 1931 that ashram started publishing. Before that, it was just various devotees who, who had published things. So when the ashram first published, because there was already this 30 question and answer version, and there was Bhagavan's essay version, since there was a demand for question and answer version, some devotees rewrote the 30 question and answer version as a 28 question and answer version, incorporating some of the improvements that Bhagavan had written, had put in the essay version. So the 28 question and answer version is a, is a compilation of, from take or of extracts from the earlier question and answer version and some improvements added by Bhagavan. But that wasn't edited either by Sri Prakash and Palai or by Bhagavan. It was some devotees did that. Um, that is the only question and answer version that is nowadays available in print. It's available in, as a small booklet in Tamil, and it's also been translated in English and many other languages. Unfortunately, the English translation, it's by uh, a person called uh, Professor T. M. P. Mahadevan. He was a professor of philosophy in Madras University, and he was a devotee of Bhagavan. But um, though he was a professor of philosophy, he had his own way of understanding things. So certain ideas, he, he slightly, um, he slightly change certain ideas according to his understanding of a greater. Um, so though his translation, on the whole, is not too bad. There are places where he goes seriously wrong. The, the only um, English translation of the essay version that is published by the ashram um, is actually a very, uh, a very free rendering and a very interpretive uh, rendering of this essay version, and it goes very far wrong in many places. It, it's a very distorted translation. So what I'm, I'm going to be basing my talk on 
my own translation, which is published on my website, and the link has been sent to you. So um, this is, I, that is, when I translate, I try to translate as accurately as possible, and where necessary to explain, because uh, often what Bhagavan writes, particularly in his poetry, is very, very, um, is expressed in a very compact way. So to understand the full implication, it needs a certain amount of explanation. But this, because this is a prose work, relatively little explanation. I mean, most of this is fairly um, straightforward, fairly um, clear what Bhagavan is saying, but it is very, very deep. That is, this is the first work most of us read when we come to Bhagavan. Um, it's an extremely good introductory work, but... Um, I don't think any of us fully understand it when we first read it, but as time goes on, we understand more, we, we begin to see more and more depth in what Bhagavan has said. So this is an extremely important work, both as a, as a very valuable introduction, but also it's a very practical work. So it's useful, it's a support to us throughout our sadha, I mean, throughout our practice, up till the very end, this is a very, a very, very valuable work. Um, so, as I say, when Bhagavan first wrote the, when Bhagavan wrote this essay version, he added an entirely new first paragraph. Um, the ideas that he expresses in this first paragraph are um, slightly adapted from the beginning of the introduction that he wrote to uh, a Tamil translation, a Tamil prose translation that he made of the Sanskrit work, Viva Kuchudamani, which is usually attributed to Shankara. So Bowen wrote a brief introduction to his translation. Uh, that translation begins with, um, that is the first, uh, the first uh, uh, portion of the introduction. I can't even say sentence, but it's <laughs> Bowen's sentences, they go on very long. Um, but the, the idea is that uh, are very similar, um, and the wording very similar, but not identical to what he says there. So this this first paragraph is a very, very important introduction because before we begin to practice self-investigation, the obvious first question is, why should we bother? Why should we, well, what is the necessity for investigating ourselves? Um, so Bhagavan, Bhagavan explains it here. What he says in the first paragraph is, um, that is, this first paragraph consists of two sentences. The first sentence is a long sentence in which Bhagavan packs many arguments, uh, many very important arguments. That is, what he says in the, in the first sentence is, the first clause is, since all sentient beings want or like to be happy always without what is called misery. This is one of the fundamental principles of Bhagavan's teaching. That is, what Bhagavan is pointing out is what we are all seeking is happiness. Some people superficially say, will say, no, no, I'm not seeking my own happiness. I want to do service to others, or I want to, I, I'm not so interested in happiness. I'm more interested in learning or in this or in that. But actually, why we want to do anything, we, we do whatever we like to do. And we like to do those things that make us, that seem to make us happy. So if, 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 if we take our aim in life, doing service to others, why is that? Because that is what makes us happy. We, we derive satisfaction from helping others. If we want to be very learned, why do we want to be very learned? Because that makes us happy. We derive pleasure from, from um, studying and whatever. So whatever, wherever, whatever effort any sentient being makes are all directed at happiness. From the smallest ant, uh, looking for a grain, carrying a heavy grain of sugar, to the highest God in heaven, all are seeking happiness. From the, uh, the worst sinner to the greatest saint, all are seeking happiness. The problem is most of us are seeking happiness in the wrong place. We think we, our happiness is dependent on things outside ourselves. So our mind is always going outwards, seeking the things that we think will make us happy and trying to avoid the things which we think will make us unhappy. 
so uh, Bowen doesn't say all that here. He gives a bit. He gives more explanation about this later on in the same work, in the fourteenth paragraph. But in this first paragraph, uh, in the, as I say, in the first clause, what he says is, since all sentient beings want to be happy always, without what is called misery. So th this is the, the first principle Bhagavan says. But these are also premises to an argument he's giving. In the second clause, he says. Since for everyone the greatest love is only for oneself, um, what that means is this, this is a, this is a very literal translation of how it's expressed in Tamil. This is a normal way of expressing it in Tamil. How we we would normally say it in English is, but we all have greatest love only for ourselves. That is, what do we love above all other things? Is we love ourselves. If we love other people, for example, why do we love them? Because they may, because we think those people are contributing to our happiness. So we lo love those people who we feel make us happy, who's, who, whose company we enjoy, who um, who just give us uh, who give us happiness and joy. Those are the people we love. If people are constantly giving us trouble, we tend to dislike them. Why? Because we all have greatest love for ourselves. So these are two premises here. By one gave the first premise is we all, what we all like is happiness, and we all have greatest love for ourselves. And then in the third clause, he says, and since happiness alone is the cause of love, cause for love, what he means by that is. We all love those things that we'll, we think will make us happy. If we think something will make us happy, we love it. If we think something is going to make us unhappy, we dislike it. So it, happiness is what is a driving force behind what we like, what we love, like or love. So uh, the, that is the implication here in these first three clauses. Is we all like to be happy. We have greatest love for ourselves and happiness alone is the cause for love, then why do we love ourselves? Because we ourselves are happiness. That is the implication. Um, so, and then he goes on to say, in order to attain that happiness, which is one's own nature, why is it one's own nature? For the reasons that he's given previously, and also for the reason that he gives after this. He says, which is one's own nature, which one experiences daily in sleep. Sleep here means dreamlessly. That is, when we are asleep, we are perfectly happy. We, so the happiness we experience in sleep, the, the, oh, and he goes on to say, in sleep, which is the void of mind. So in the state of uh, deep dreamless sleep, there is no mind, and hence there's no experience of anything other than ourself. But in the absence of all other things, we are perfectly happy. What does that imply? But we ourselves are happiness. So for the reasons given in the first three clauses, and for this reason, Bhagavan uh, is, is explaining to us why we should understand that happiness is our real nature. Um, so, uh, uh, so in order to attain that happiness, which is one's own nature, which one experiences daily in uh, sleep, which is devoid of mind, what is required? He, that he says in the final clause of this uh, sentence, tanne tan aridal vendum. That means oneself, knowing oneself is necessary. That is, since we ourselves are happiness, in order to attain that happiness, we need to know what we actually are. Why do we not experience uh, that hap If happiness is what we actually are, why do we not experience it? Because now we are not. We, though we are aware of ourselves, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are because we now mistake ourselves to be a person, to be a finite, um, a finite creature. Um, so, if we know what we actually are, we will know that we are infinite happiness. Happiness is our own real nature, and that happiness, there is no limit to that happiness. And not only is happiness our real nature, because happiness is the cause of love. Love is our real nature. That is, we are, our love is infinite. But because we've limited ourselves as a body, our love has now been distorted as likes and dislikes, desires and aversions, um, uh, hopes and fears, and so on. So all these are a distortion of uh, 
of a pure love, which is our own real nature. So, um, so once, so he concludes this first sentence saying, oneself knowing oneself is necessary. So how do we know ourselves? This is what he says in the next sentence. For that, that means for, for knowing oneself, um, jnana vichara called who am I alone is the principal means. Jnana vichara um, means awareness investigation. That is jnana um, means knowledge. In this context, in the spiritual context, it means knowledge in the sense of awareness. Uh, what awareness? That is the fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. That is the awareness that we are investigating. Um, the word vichara means uh, uh, investigation. So jnana vichara means awareness investigation. And he says, uh, he says this uh, jnana vichara is called who am I? Why is it called who am I? Because the jnana we are investigating, the awareness we are investigating is that fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. So investigating it is called who am I? Uh, so that, that uh, awareness investigation called who am I alone is the principal means. Why does, what, what, in what sense does Bhagavan say it is the principal means? Um, he doesn't expand on it here, but what we have to infer from what he has said in so many other places, that in, in so many places, Bhagavan says, this is the only means by which we can know ourselves. So why does he say here it is the principal means? Because there, there are many other uh, means. That the word for means is sadhana. Sadhana is often translated as practice, but what sadhana actually means is a means. So there are so many other means. People practice um, uh, bhakti, they practice yoga, they practice different types of meditation and so on. All these are means, but they are not direct means. That is, all these, we can explain this with an analogy. Supposing you've got one river that flows into the ocean, but it has many tributaries. All those tributaries, none of them go directly to the ocean. All the tributaries first have to join the main river, the principal river, and then having merged in the principal river, they have then carried away to the ocean. It is the, in that sense that Bhagavan says this is the principal means, because ultimately we cannot know what we actually are without investigating ourselves. That is, you, if you want to see the sun, you have to look at it. If you don't look at it, you can't see it. Likewise, if you want to know what we actually are, we need to look at ourselves. We need to investigate ourselves. So this is the only by, means by which we can know ourselves. All other means must eventually lead to this, to this. So whatever other spiritual path we may follow, eventually it can lead us to the final goal that other spiritual paths may have their own goals, but the ultimate goal is to know ourselves as we actually are. To reach this ultimate goal, we need to, uh, we need to investigate ourselves. So all other paths are tributaries leading to this principal path, uh, the path of self-investigation. That is what Bhagavan implies here when he says, but, but, um, for knowing ourselves, jnana vichara called who am I alone is the principal means. So this is, he, in this first paragraph, Bhagavan is explaining to us why we need to investigate ourselves. Um, I, will, I will skim through uh, some of the following paragraphs because I think, I think what's most important is that we focus on the practice. Because uh, always with Bhagavad teaching, the practice is most important. Once we understand the practice, then we, we go into other teachings of Bhagavan that don't seem to be directly uh, uh, um, uh, explaining what the practice is. We will understand how these all Bhagavan's other teachings, they all have practical implications. They all uh, point us in the same direction, the need to know ourselves. So, as I said earlier, the first question asked by Shiva Crash and Play was, uh, Nana, who am I? To that Bhagavan, because in those days Bhagavan wasn't speaking much, so he probably wrote on the ground, he wrote Arive Nan. Arive Nan means awareness alone is I. Um, then Shiva Crash and Play asked, what is the nature of that awareness? And Bhagavan said, Satchitanandam. 
Satchitananda means sat is um, being or what act, what actually exists. Chit is awareness or what is actually aware. Ananda means actual happiness, real happiness, infinite happiness. So Satchitananda is is the nature of that awareness that we actually are. In other words, it's not an awareness of things other than ourselves. It's just that fundamental awareness of our own existence. Satchit means awareness of existence. That's another way of interpreting it. So Satchitananda is the happiness of being aware of our own existence, uh, or just just our own existence. Um, so that is the, the Bhagavan's first two answers. Um, many years later, when this was first to be published, uh, Shiv Prakash and Pillai's nephew, Manikam Pillai, who was also a very good devotee of Bhagavan, he brought the manuscript to Bhagavan. That is, Shiv Prakash and Pillai had edited, as I said, 25 questions and answers. And so she, uh, Manikam Pillai brought it to Bhagavan to get his approval for adding that in the book. And when Bhagavan uh, began to read it, he saw that, she, that so many things were written there that he hadn't said. And then Bhagavan said, oh, I didn't, see, I, I didn't write all of I didn't say all of this. And then Bhagavan himself said, oh, because he had studied philosophy, he would have, he would have learned all these things when he was at university. So in order to help him to, under, because my first answer was just Arivainan, in order to help him to understand that, he added all this portion. So let it remain. It may be useful for others. So most of the second paragraph is what Shiv Kash and Pillai added, which is the standard um, in uh, a greater philosophy of I am not this, um, basically what he's saying, I'm not this physical body. Or, this physical body is not I. Um, the five uh, sense organs are not I. The five organs of action are not I. Um, the five pranas, the five life forces are not I. And um, even the ignorance that remains when all these merge in sleep, even that is not I. Um, so this is, this is, this is, um, this is the preliminary of, uh, a great philosophy. That is why this is important. That that in the particular way it is expressed here is is in the context of Indian philosophy. That is, who am I has been a central question in Indian philosophy for thousands of years, and there were so many different systems of philosophy, including even the materialists. So everyone had their own their own answer to this question: Who am I? Uh, some group of materialists said, no, we are just a physical body, nothing more, nothing less. When this, we, when this body is born, we are born. When this body dies, we die. That's uh, the end of the matter. That was the view of the Chabakas. But even among the Chabakas, there were different views. So some of them have more refined views, and some of them consider the, um, the, we are not this body, we have a five sense organs, or we have a five... Uh, um, the, the five uh, organs of action, or we have the five uh, life forces. Or, or one sentence I missed out is the, the mind which thinks is not I, because that was a, some of the materialists thought we, though we are not this physical body, we are just the mind that thinks. Um, so all these have to be first rejected. Um, that is, none of these are what we actually are. So the particular way it's expressed here is in the context of thousands of years of Indian philosophy. But what we need to understand is that um, it can be explained in various different ways. But basically, we cannot be any object. We are a subject. So this body is an object. This mind is an object. Everything that we experience as other than ourselves is an object. That is, though we take this body to be I, at the same time we experience it as an object. Likewise with the mind. Now we take this mind to be I. I am thinking, I am wanting, I am liking, I am... All, all these, we, we identify ourselves with all these things. But if we think of it, the mind, all the thoughts that constitute the mind, are objects perceived by us. Even our desires, our likes, our dislikes, they're things experienced by us. They're things that appear and disappear in our awareness. So we are something other than all these things. So why this is important, if we are to investigate ourselves, we first need to understand what we are not. 
because otherwise we'll be investigating the, the wrong thing. So we are not any phys any object, whether physical object or even a subtle mental object. We are not any object. We are the subject. We are that which can never be objectified. But the truth is, we are not even the subject. We have to, we have to start by um, by separating ourselves as subject from all the objects. So what we are trying to investigate is only ourself as the subject. In other words, we're investigating only I, not anything known by I, not anything that appears or disappears in our awareness. So when we are trying to attend to ourselves, we are trying to attend to that which exists permanently, which, which anything that appears and disappears must be something other than ourselves, because we are there. It's in our view that they appear and disappear. So we are there before they appeared. We are there after they disappear. So even the mind is something that appears and disappears. It appears in waking and dream. It disappears in sleep. So even this mind is not ourself. Uh, the one thing that continues in all the three states is our fundamental awareness of our own existence. That is what we actually are. That is what we need to investigate. How do we experience that fundamental awareness of our own existence? As I am. But as ego, we, we mix along with this I am, we mix adjuncts. So we, we take ourselves, we, I am this person called Michael. I am this body. I am this mind. That is all false identification. So we need to, we, we need to, um, we are not to attend to anything that we mistake to be ourselves. We have to attend to ourself alone. So we have to attend to only to the fundamental awareness I am. That is how we investigate ourselves. That's, that's why this, um, what is said in the second paragraph is very important. The next question that Sri Prakashan Pillai asked is, when will Swarupa Dashana, um, arise. Swarupa dashana. Swarupa means one's own real nature. Dashana means, literally means seeing. So when will we see our own real nature? Um, Bhagavan says, it's, uh, Bhagavan's answer was, we, only when the perception of the world ceases. And that is what he's, um, that idea is what he, um, that is, he, it was expressed slightly differently in the question and answer version. Bhagavan adapted it uh, to make it clearer and less, uh, to give less scope for any misinterpretation. Bhagavan wrote this third paragraph. What he wrote in the third paragraph is, if the mind which is the cause for all awareness and for all activity ceases or subsides, perception of the world will depart. Um, what he means here by saying the mind is the cause for all awareness, obviously, though Bhagavan uses the same word here for awareness that he used when he said awareness alone is I, there he's not, he's talking about pure awareness. Uh, awareness that the mind is the cause of is awareness of things other than ourselves. So it's only the mind is the cause for all awareness of other things. In other words, it's a cause for the perception of the world. Um, and it's also, of course, for all activity. So if this mind ceases, perception of the world will also cease. And then he says in the second sentence, just as, he gives an analogy first, just as unless awareness of the imaginary snake goes, awareness of the rope, which is the basis or foundation, will not arise. That is, so long as we mistake a rope to be a snake, we cannot be aware of the, we, we, we cannot see the rope as it is. So in order to see the rope as it is, the, uh, uh, the misperception of it as a snake has to go. So if we look very carefully at the rope and recognize that it is a, a, a that it is not a snake but a rope, the uh, perception of the snake, is, which is um, imaginary, or the, the word he uses, culpita, which means fabricated, meaning it's a mental fabrication. That's why I translate it as imaginary here. Um, so the snake is just a mental fabrication. It doesn't actually exist. What actually exists is only a rope. Um, but in order to see the rope as it is, we need to stop seeing it as a snake. Of course, how we stop seeing it as a snake is by seeing it as it is. But uh, ceasing to mistake it to be a snake is uh, is necessary. Otherwise, so long as we are seeing it as a snake, we 
we are not seeing it as a rope. We're not seeing it as it actually is. So that's the analogy Bhagavan gives. So um, just like that, um, uh, unless perception of the world, which is a fabrication, a mental creation, departs, um, uh, uh, seeing of one's own real nature, which is the basis, will not arise. That is just as the the rope is the basis for the appearance of the snake. Our real nature is the basis for the appearance of the world. But so long as we are seeing the world, we are not seeing our real nature. And when we see our real nature, we will not see the world. Why is this? There's a, there's a deep reason for this. That is, we, um, and this is a very, very important principle of Bhagavan teaching. That is, we are aware of things other than ourselves only when we limit ourselves as a form. That is, when we rise as ego, we always experience ourselves as I am this body. That is, we limit ourselves to the form of a body. And what Bhagavan means by body, as he clarified in verse 5 of Uludun Apadu, by body, he doesn't just mean the physical body. He means all the five sheaths. The five sheaths mean the physical body, the life that animates it, the mind, intellect, and will that function within it. So all these are called the five sheaths. These are, we, we, ex though these are, we can distinguish these five things, we experience them collectively. We experience the whole bundle of five sheaths as ourself. So when Bhagavan says ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am his body, he, he means not only that we take, mistake ourselves to be this physical body, but also the, uh, the life, the mind, the intellect, and the will. We identify ourselves with all these uh, things. Um, so when we rise as ego, we always identify ourselves with this body consisting of five sheaths. And these are all forms. Because we experience ourselves as a form, we experience other forms. So the whole world appears only because we've limited ourselves as this body. That we can see this from our experience in dream. As soon as we begin dreaming, we experience ourselves as a though the whole dream world is our own mental creation. We don't experience our while dreaming, we don't experience ourselves as the creator of a dream. We seem to be a person within our dream. That is, we first identify ourselves with a, a body, and then through the five senses of that body, we project a world. So it's only when we are limited as a body that we perceive a world. So why is it necessary that perception of the world must cease in order for us to know our real nature? Because so long as we are perceiving a world, we are perceiving ourselves as a person within that world. In other words, we've limited ourselves to a name and form. Therefore, we are not knowing ourselves as we actually are, which is just pure awareness. Um, then in the next paragraph, Bhagavan continues the, the, the same subject, but since he says here, since he said in this third paragraph, um, what is the cause for the perception of the world? It is the mind. So what, is the, what does he mean by mind? That is what he explains, he begins to explain in the next paragraph. He says, what is called mind is an adiseya shakti, an extraordinary power that exists in Atmasarupa. Atmasarupa means the real nature of oneself. Adiseya Shakti means an extraordinary power. So the mind is an extraordinary power that exists in Atmasarupa. The extraordinary power that Bhagavan is referring to here is the power that is generally called Maya. That is, according to Bhagavan, Maya is nothing but our own mind. Um, so it is the mind that is the cause for the appearance of all these things. So, it, it, so, as I say, in the first sentence, he says, what is called mind is an extraordinary power that exists in our real nature, in what we actually are. It, I mean, he says, it makes all thought... I'll just add one thing here, but he's, Bhagavan doesn't mention here, but he uses the same term, Adiseya Shakti, in verse 6 of Arunacha Ashtakam. And there he says that, that Adiseya Shakti, that he's, he's talking, he's a dressing Arunachala, but saying that Arunachala is the heart, the light of awareness, the one real substance. And he says, in you, that, that is an Adiseya Shakti exists in you and is not other than you. That is, though this 
though Maya is spoken of as something that exists in Brahman or in our real nature, it is not something other than ourself. That is what the mind actually is, is nothing but our real nature. It's just that because of our looking outwards, it's distorted and it appears all, as all this multiplicity. Um, so, as I say, in the first sentence he says, what is called mind is an extraordinary power that exists in Atmasarupa, implying that the mind is Maya. And then he says, it makes all thoughts appear. That is, the cause for all other thoughts is the mind. And as he ex will explain in the next paragraph, what the mind essentially is, is only the first thought I. The first thought I means ego. So it is ego, uh, but a subject that makes all other thoughts, which are objects, appear. Um, and then he says, when one looks, excluding all thoughts, solitary, there's no such thing as mind. In other words, mind is nothing but thoughts. But of all thoughts, as he says in the next paragraph, of all thoughts, the, the root thought, the first thought, is this thought I, ego. That is, so that is what the mind essentially is, as he explained often in other places. Um, therefore, thought alone is the nature, is the very nature of the mind. And then he goes on to say, excluding thoughts, there is not separately any such thing as world. That is the, we, we, we assume that the world is something that exists independent of our mind. It's something out there. The mind is here inside this little head of ours and the, the world is out there. It, exactly the same illusion we're under in, in, when we're dreaming. There seems to be a vast world out there and we seem to be limited within the confines of a small body. But when we wake up, we recognize that that body and that entire world existed only in our own mind. So likewise, all this, this entire universe exists only in our mind and it is nothing but thoughts. That is, as Bhagavan says in verse 6 of Uludhunapadu, the world is nothing but the five kinds of sense impressions. It's nothing other than that. They're Andrew. It's nothing other than that. What does he mean by that? That is, the five sense impressions are sights, sounds, tactile sensations, tastes, and smells. Without these five, there's no such thing as the world. That is what we, what we, the, the, the world is nothing but these five kinds of sense impressions. We, we, we experience these sense impressions, we experience sights, sounds, etc., and we infer the existence of a world outside. We think, oh, what I'm seeing is caused by some world outside. What I'm hearing is caused by some world outside. We make exactly the same mistake in, in, in dream. In dream, it seems to us that all that we are seeing and hearing and tasting and touching and feeling is caused by things that exist outside ourselves. But when we wake up, we recognize, no, it was all in my own mind. So just like the whole world we experience in dream is nothing but our own thoughts, the world we are now experiencing is nothing but our own thoughts, according to Bhagavan. That's why he says, excluding thoughts, there is not separately any such thing as world. In sleep, there are no thoughts, and there is also no world. In waking and dream, there are thoughts, and there is also a world. So what do we have to infer from this? But the world is nothing but thoughts. Um, then he goes on to he goes on to give an analogy. This analogy is given in um, in some of the Upanishads, I think, one at least in one of the Upanishads. But there it is implied that Brahman is what projects the world. But here Bhagavan is very very clear. It's only the mind that projects the world. Just as a spider springs out thread from within itself. This is not referring to the web, but uh, we, sometimes you see a spider will uh, will dangle from a single thread, and then it will seem to climb up that thread. That is, it had projected that thread from within itself, and then it again withdraws it back into itself. Um, I think it's called a gossamer thread. Um, so just as a spider spins out thread from within itself and again draws it back into itself, so the mind makes the world appear, or projects the world, from within itself and again dissolves it back into itself. As I say, in the Upanishad, it is said that Brahman projects the world. But it is true in a sense, but it's not Brahman as Brahman that projects the world, it is Brahman as mind. 
It's only the mind that projects the world. So it's not Brahman in its pure form that projects the world. It's only when we rise as mind, as ego, that we project the world. Um, in our pure state, when we don't rise as mind, there is no world. So it's only the mind that is projecting the world. And then he goes on to say, when the mind comes out from Atma Sarupa, the world appears. Um, that, that is, whenever the mind rises, what, what he, obviously the mind isn't literally coming out from Atma Sarupa, because Atma Sarupa is the infinite whole. So what he means by coming out, when he rises uh, as this mind, the world appears. And then he concludes what he, that is, he draws the same conclusion that he drew from in the previous paragraph. Therefore, when the world appears, one's own real nature does not appear. And when one's own real nature uh, appears, the world does not appear. That is, so long as we see the world, we are not seeing ourselves as we actually are. And when we see ourselves as we actually are, we will not see the world. Um, and then he go, he, um, uh, then he, for the first time, he, he begins to talk about the practice. In the next sentence, he says, if one goes on investigating the nature of the mind, one's self alone will end as mind. This is a very, very cryptic way of saying it. What it implies is, if we go on investigating the nature of the mind, we will see that what now appears as mind is actually nothing but ourself, our own real nature, what we actually are. That is like just that's like saying if you if you look at the snake carefully enough, uh, you will find that it's the snake alone that appeared, but a rope alone that has appeared as a snake. Likewise, if we investigate uh, what we ourselves are, what its mind is, we will find that it is nothing but our own real nature. And Michael, then in the next set. Can I ask you a question about that very point, Michael? Yes, yes certainly, certainly. Uh, because it's a, a point of confusion that lingers with me a lot of the time, if not all the time. You see, the whole world appears only because we limit ourselves as the... Ramana says, the mind makes all thoughts appear. The mind yeah. makes all thoughts yeah. appear. And he says, thoughts alone, thought alone is the very nature of the mind. Yes. And then I say... But isn't the practice, the very practice of self-inquiry, dependent entirely on using the mind and the thoughts? And whom do these thoughts occur? A thought. And who am I? Another thought using the mind. Right. Okay. <laughs> yes. We, we, is that we, kind we, of what you're saying? It, um, it, it is the mind that is investigating itself. But the difference is the mind, that when, when we face outwards, when we, in other words, when we face away from ourselves, we project this world. In self-investigation, we are not facing away from ourselves. We are facing back towards ourselves. And by facing back towards ourselves, we thereby bring about the dissolution of the mind. That is, we seem to be mind only when we're attending to anything other than ourselves. When we cease attending to other things, the mind dissolves. So we use the mind to dissolve the mind. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Is that Sorry. clear? Yeah. Is that does that fully clear your yeah. your? It, it does. Yet I'm. St it's still it's still kind of vague for me because the mind is critical to do self inquiry. Yes. You have to turn it upon itself in order for it to dissolve yes. using the mind, using thoughts. If if we didn't have a mind, we couldn't destroy it. <laughs> Very good. So it's work. critical to have a mind in order to destroy it. If we didn't have it, then there would be no problem at all. So that that is, we have to use the mind. But if we use the mind to try and kill it, we will never be able to kill it. What we need to do is to see. We use the mind to investigate it because if we investigate it, then we find there's no such thing as mind at all. And we leave it behind. That's leave why Bhagavan said all other sadhanas are like the thief, the thief pretending to be a policeman. Uh, the, the, that is, the, the thief acting as a policeman, pretending to try and catch the thief. He, it will never do it. So, so long as our sadhanas pre, presuppose the existence of the mind, they will only perpetuate that. 
So but in self-investigation, we are not presupposing the existence of the mind. The mind is questioning its own existence. Am I what I now seem to be? Now I seem to be Ted, but is this what I actually am? So it's the mind that is aware of itself as I am Ted, but now that mind is, is trying to, is leaving Ted aside and trying to investigate only the I. When it does so, it will dissolve. Ted, of course, and Ted's world will dissolve along with it. And what will remain is what you actually are. Thank you with that. I, 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 of course, I already knew that intellectually. But in the practice of self-inquiry, it sometimes comes up, why am I using the mind so much to get rid of itself? Uh, but well, you, you answered yeah, it well. But use it, uh, th that's another point I'll, I'll mention here. Because you say you, you need thoughts and everything. We The only thing... That is, thoughts are about things other than ourselves. Sometimes Bhagavan metaphorically referred to this practice as thought, as meditation or whatever, but that is only a metaphorical use. That is, the mind directed towards other things is a thought. The mind directed to itself is a dissolution of thought. <laughs> that so we, so we, are, we are turning the mind back on itself and thereby bringing about the dissolution of the first thought I. When the first thought I dissolves, all other thoughts will dissolve along with it. Thank you. Thank you. Go okay. On. So I'll, I'll continue. So what he, what he says in this uh, sentence, I say, said in a rather cryptic way, but the implication is that if we go on investigating the nature of the mind, what we will find is our real nature. That is like saying, if you look very carefully at the snake, you will find the rope. If we look very carefully at ourselves, we will find, uh, if the mind looks very carefully at itself, it will find what it actually is, which is Atmosarupa, our, our real nature. Our real nature. Um, then he goes on to say in the next sentence, the mind stands by always going after uh, uh, something, a, a stoolum. Stulum means something that is gross. So the, what do you mean by going after? The mind always attaches itself to something gross. In other words, the mind cannot stand without identifying itself as a body. Um, so as soon as we rise as mind or ego, first thing is we take a body to be ourselves, And then we grasp other gross things. So grasping gross things is the nature of the mind. Solitarily, it doesn't stand. That is, without anything gross to grasp, the mind cannot stand alone. And then he uh, concludes this paragraph saying, by saying, the mind alone is described as sukshma sarira, the subtle body, and jiva, the soul. Uh, what he's meaning by the word mind here is not the is not the totality of all thought. He's talking about the, the, what the mind essentially is, which is the root thought I, in other words, ego. So it's ego that is described as a subtle body and as jiva. This is a slightly different, here Bhagavan is using the term subtle body in a different sense to the sense in which it's generally used in Advaita. Um, there's a particular reason for that, but we need not go into that in, uh, at this point. Then in the next paragraph, he continues the same subject about what is the mind. Um, that he's, he's, uh, analyzing the nature of the mind. In the next paragraph, he begins by saying, whatever it is that rises in this body as I, that alone is the mind. In other words, ego alone is mind. That ego is the, why does he say it rises in this body? Because whenever we rise as ego, we project and take a body to be ourselves. So it seems that this I is rising in the body. Um, that is within the confines of this body, but we seem to rise as ego. But this body, of course, doesn't exist in, independent of ego. The body itself is a projection of the mind, of, of ego. Um, but whenever we rise, we confine ourselves within the limits of a body. So uh, the, the implication of this sentence is that, that the ego, that awareness that limits itself as a body, that alone is mind. And then he goes on to say, if one investigates in what place the thought called I first appears in the body, one will come to know that it is in the heart, that it is 
in the heart. This sentence is often misunderstood by people because in some contexts, when people pester Bhagavan to say where in, because Bhagavan referred to our real nature as the heart. Bhagavan said the heart is pure awareness, heart is what we actually are. But people whose minds are gross, are outward looking, they cannot help but thinking, particularly if they've been, uh, if they're, accustomed to uh, yoga philosophy, they cannot help but think in terms of the body. So there were some people who passed the Bhagavan to say where in the body the heart exists. So to satisfy such people, Bhagavan said the heart is two digits right from the center of the chest. That is relative to this body, that is where in this body do we, that is, we experience this whole body as ourself. But that feeling of self-awareness is centered in the chest, two digits to the right from the center of the chest. This has no spiritual significance. It is, this is true only uh, with reference to the body. So that is not the heart the Bhagavan is talking about here. Uh, that, uh, so, so um, as I say, what he says is, if one investigates in what place the thought called I first appears in the body, what does he mean by in what place? He doesn't mean that we should have to look for a place in the body. What he, he uses the term place in a metaphorical sense. From what does the thought called I, the thought called I means ego, from what did the ego first arise? It arise that is, where, from where can we rise as ego? Only from ourself, only from our real nature, from what we actually are. We can understand this if we consider um, waking from sleep or beginning to dream from sleep. As soon as we begin to, as, as we wake up or begin to dream, we rise as ego. From where do we rise? We rise from what existed in sleep. What existed in sleep is only I am. So that pure awareness I am is the source from which we rise. That is the heart. So that is what Bhagavan is referring to here. So if we investigate the place, uh, uh, the place where the thought, in what place did the thought called I first appear in the body? One would come to know it is in the heart. And then he says, that alone is the birthplace of the mind. Again here, birthplace is, is metaphorical. But the, the, where the mind originates from, in other words, the source of the mind is only the heart. And the heart is nothing but that fundamental awareness, I am. That is, it is only from I am that we rise as I am this body. Um, then he gives a very nice practical clue, which is very useful for people when they first start on this practice. Because when people first are first told about this practice of self-investigation, many people find it difficult to grasp at first how we can attend to ourselves. Because we're so used to attending to objects, how to attend to the subject? The subject obviously isn't an object. So how do we attend to ourselves? Bhagavan gave, gave a very useful clue here. He said, even if one goes on thinking, I, I, it will take and leave one in that place. What does he mean by thinking, I, I? That is, if we think of any word, it's not the word that is important. Every word denotes something. If I say a word like running, it produces, it, 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 the, 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 the mere mention of running brings a certain image to our mind. Some person, is, some person or animal is running. If I mention an object like a tree, it brings an, a certain object to our mind. So any word refers to a certain object or event or action. And um, therefore, when we mention that word, it brings that thing to our mind. The, the, this first person pronoun I refers to what? Though we often refer to the body and to the mind as I, I am sitting, I am thinking, I am talking, we refer to these objects as I because they seem to be ourselves. What I essentially refers to is only the awareness, the awareness that mistakes itself to be this body and mind. So by thinking of, if we, if we, if we think I, I, but not, not just uh, mechanically like a japa, I, 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 but if we slowly and contemplatively think of this word, uh, think of I, and instead of thinking of the word I, that, that is, 
we use this word I to direct our attention back to that which is denoted by this word I. So what does this word I refer to? It's to that fundamental awareness of our own existence. So this is a this is a helpful clue if we apply it properly to help us familiarize ourselves with self investing with self attentive with being self attentive. Once we become familiar with what it means to be self attentive, then this is no longer necessary. But it's a helpful clue for people who are starting on this path. Um, then in the final four sentences of this uh, paragraph, Bhagavan again uh, analyzes the mind, but here he says something that he says in many, many places, and this is a very, very important principle of his teachings. That is, uh, in the previous paragraph, he said the mind is nothing but thoughts. If we remove all thoughts, there's no such thing as mind. So he's, uh, the totality of all thoughts is that is a collective name for the totality of all thoughts is mind. But other thoughts are constantly changing. All thoughts are constantly coming and going. So is there anything in the mind that is constant? That is, so long as there's mind, is there any one thought that is always there? Yes, that is the thought called I. What Bhagavan means by the thought called I is ego. That is this, uh, uh, why does he call ego a thought? Because it's not the pure awareness I am, it's the pure awareness I am mixed and conflated with adjuncts. Since the adjuncts are thought, the package, I am this body, uh, is a thought. Um, so ego is, is, a, is a thought. Of all thoughts, it's the first. But it is unlike all other thoughts. Why? Because all other thoughts are jada. That is, they are not aware. No other thought is aware of itself or aware of anything else. Whereas this first thought called I is the only thought that is endowed with awareness. So this is the subject. All other thoughts are objects. So why is this the first thought? Because without the subject, there cannot be any objects. So it, with, without the thinker, there cannot be any thoughts. So this thought called I is the thought that is in whose view all other thoughts appear. So this is the first thought. The term he uses in Tamil for first thought is mudal ninevu. Mudal means not only first, it means primal, basic, original, or causal. So this is the thought that is the basis of all other thoughts. It's the origin of all other thoughts. It's the cause of all other thoughts. That is, only when we rise as ego do other thoughts come into existence. So in the next sentence, he says, only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Bhagavan often said, the, the, the mind and world exist, uh, arise simultaneously. That is, the mind is here, meaning the ego, the subject, and the world is all other thoughts. But here he says that the um, that the uh, this first thought I, the ego, this is what rises first. And then no, only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Why does he say this? This is a case of simultaneous causation. That is, the cause is ego. The effect is all other thoughts, including the whole world. Though it's a case of simultaneous uh, uh, causation, that is, even, even in the case of simultaneous causation, Though the, the cause and the effect occur simultaneously, logically, that is, in the causal sequence, the cause comes, the cause has to come first. You cannot have a cause without, you cannot have an effect without its cause. So um, we can illustrate this with an example. Uh, that is one uh, simple case of, uh, of simultaneous causation is one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. If you've got a stationary billiard ball and a moving billiard ball hits the stationary one, as soon as that is the striking of the, the that is the moving ball striking the, um, the uh, stationary ball at once causes the uh, stationary ball to move. So the striking of the two balls is the cause. The effect is the movement of the of the, of the stationary ball. These occur simultaneously, 
that logically which comes first, though they occur at the same time, in causal sequence, the cause uh, that is the, without the striking, the uh, effect would never have taken place. So it's in that sense the Bhagavan says here, only after this rises do other thoughts rise. That is, the first thought I is the cause, all other thoughts are the effects. So without this cause, the other thoughts can't arise. Though they, as soon as this cause arises, all other thoughts, so many other thoughts arise along with it. Um, so th that's Michael, what. I have a question. Yes, certainly. <laughs> so in a in an infant, a newborn infant. Yes. Um, would you say that there is a sense of I ness in the uh, infant? Yes, definitely, definitely. If you ask modern psychologists, they'll say only at the age of uh, two or something does ego develop because they are viewing ego objectively. Uh, ego is not an object, ego is a subject. That is, is not a small child aware of things other than itself. It's aware of its mother, it's aware of, it may be not very clear, uh, that is, it, 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 a newborn child, for example, it may not see things very clearly because its eyes have yet to focus and got, get used to different uh, interpreting all the information that seems to be coming from the outside world. So, But still, the child is aware of itself as I am perceiving this, I, I am experiencing this. It's not aware of itself in words, but that—that—that that, that is, it's... It's aware of itself as the subject and other things as objects perceived by it. So there cannot so be awareness of anything other than ourself without ego. So a baby can never get realization because they can never do Atma Vichara. Um, <laughs> well, they can, <laughs> just like we can. But they're unlikely to because their vasanas will be, it's only when we, generally we don't take to Atma Vichara until we come to Guru and Guru points out to us uh, the errors of our ways. But seeking happiness outside is wrong. But in the view of the small child, it's dependent on things other than itself. If the mother doesn't give milk on time, the baby will start crying. It needs that milk. The only when it get, when it gets some milk, then it's happy. When it doesn't have its milk, it's unhappy. So it's already um, it's already uh, seeking happiness outside itself. Because that is the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind is to is to have the share of vasanas, to seek happiness outside. Does that adequately answer your question? So I'm thinking that once you have taken birth, the eye consciousness is alive and kicking. Only, or the after, ego the, only after the eye consciousness, only after the ego rises, do we seem to have taken birth. Right. So it's there because from the birth, birth is, and... it's all this is a dream. The <laughs> dream of this dream is ego. When we dream a dream, we we take ourselves to be a person in that dream. So in this long dream of our, what we call our present life, it began with us mistaking ourselves to be a baby. But we, that mistake, I am this baby, it, it can, we cannot have mistaken ourselves to be I am this baby without first rising as ego. So ego, according to Bhagavan, Bhagavan says it very, very clearly. In the, the same idea that he expresses here, Bhagavan expresses in verse 26 of Uludunapya in a very clear and emphatic way. He says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. That is, ego is the seed that sprouts as all this. So according to Bhagavan, ego is the, is the basis of all, all awareness of things other than ourselves. That is, it's only in the view of ego that other things seem to exist. Is that clear? That is clear, but I'm, I guess it will take me some time to really digest the information and understand it um, in that context. So apparently, the first thing that rises is the ego. 
and from the ego rises the body. All other thoughts. Or are they occurring simultaneously? They occur simultaneously, but the cause is ego. <sighs> That's why Bhagavan says only after this rises do other. Uh, uh, that that's uh, he says. Um, only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Other thoughts means all phenomena are thoughts, as he said in the previous paragraph. The whole world is nothing but thoughts. So the world appears only after we rise as ego. Though it occurs simultaneously, the causes are rising as ego. The effect is the world. He says in verse seven of Uludunapadam. Though the world and um, and the term he uses there is aribu awareness. That awareness is referring to the mind or ego. Though the world and awareness arise and subside simultaneously, the world shines by awareness. As I say, he's talking there about awareness arising and subsiding. What is the awareness that arises and subsides? It's only ego. So it's not the pure awareness he's talking about here. So the world shines by awareness. That is, the world cannot be known except by ego. So the world is dependent on ego. So ego is the, is the, is the cause, the origin from which the world sprouts. That's why he used that analogy in the previous paragraph. Of, of the spider uh, uh, projecting the, I mean, uh, the spider spinning the thread out from within itself and again withdrawing it back into itself. Likewise, the world projects the, sorry, the mind projects the world from within itself and again draws it back within. So then <clears throat> it does seem to some extent it's a spontaneous occurrence of the ego. Yes, you can say so. That is, we can't. Because the ego is the cause for everything else, we cannot find any, there, can, there cannot be any cause for the rising of ego, because there cannot be a cause for the first cause. Now, all other things come into existence only when we rise as ego. So ego is the first cause. How does this ego come into existence? Sometimes when Bhagavan was asked this, he said, he would say because of pramada. Pramada means non-attentiveness, negligence, being self-negligent. He sometimes said the same thing in another, using another term, avichara, non-vichara, non-investigation. Obviously, that is not the cause. But why Bhagavan says that pramada or avichara is the, is the cause? Because the, the way to bring about the dissolution of our ego is by attending to ourself. Not attending to ourself is the cause, but who is it who doesn't attend to itself? It's only ego. Our real nature never fails to attend to itself. Pramadra is not a problem for, for Brahman. It's only a problem for, for Jiva, for ego. So uh, there, there is no cause of ego. And if we investigate this ego, we will find that it had never risen. And therefore, ne nothing else had risen. So the ultimate truth is a jata. But, all, right. you know, but one thing we have to remember about all, when we read Bhagavan's teachings, we have to remember Bhagavan, Bhagavan have one aim and one aim alone. That is to turn our mind back within to investigate ourselves. So whatever teachings he gave had that purpose, it had that aim in mind. I mean, it was for that purpose alone that Bhagavan gave us these teachings. So why he, why he, this is, why this is such an important teaching, he, he, what Bhagavan is teaching us here is, uh, that is, uh, this is another way of saying the whole world is nothing but a dream. The dream, only after the dream arises does the dream, uh, does the dream appear. So only after we rise as ego does this whole world appear, because we are the cause. We are the, it is from ourselves that all other things appear. It's from ourself as ego. Ego appears from our real nature. From ego, everything else appears. So um, when you say ego appears from real nature, yes. so the ego is an expression of the real nature being... I wouldn't say it's an expression. Our real nature doesn't need to express itself. Our real nature is just as it is. 
That is so ego that, is neither our real nature nor is it the body. It's some spurious entity that rises in between. And it's the cause of all our problems. If we investigate it, it will take flight. It will, it will dissolve and disappear. So that Bhagavan's sole name is to get us to investigate this ego. Uh, you know, that part I have absolutely no problem. Right. Uh, but if you say that ego is occurring spontaneously. Yes. And it's occurring from the consciousness. Yes. Bhagavan that, doesn't even say it is occurring. He says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Bhagavan doesn't actually say ego has come into existence. He says, if it comes into existence, everything else will come into existence. Because if we investigate it, as he often emphasized, if we investigate it, we will find it had never come into existence. There is no such thing as ego at all. But merely saying there's no such thing as ego doesn't solve our problem because so long as we're aware of other things, what is aware of those other things? It is this non-existent ego. So how to get rid of this non-existent ego? By investigating it. If we look at it, just like the snake doesn't actually exist. If we look at the snake, we find the rope. If we look at this ego, we find pure awareness. So investigating this ego is, the whole point is, Bhagavan is trying to get us to investigate this ego. Because if, this is the cause for everything else. So all other problems are caused only by our rising as ego. So we need to invest. And how do we get rid of ego? Because ego is, a, is not real. We cannot... You, if you see a snake, if you see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, if you take a, a stick and beat it, you cannot kill the snake. There's only one way to kill the snake. So look at it carefully and see that it was never a snake. So likewise, the only way to kill this ego is to look at it carefully. You can try any amount of yoga and meditation and pranayama and this and that. So many sadhanas you can do, none of them will kill the ego. The only way to kill ego is to look at it. In other words, to be keenly self-attentive. That is the whole purpose of this. That's all this is. Bhagavan here is laying the foundation for what he goes on to say in the subsequent paragraphs about the practice. So I guess my question really is, why does a spontaneous ego arise? And that maybe we don't have an answer for that. Even Bhagavan couldn't answer that question. <laughs> Bhagavan said, you first find that ego and bring it to me. Once you, if you can find it and bring it to me, then we can investigate, then we can inquire about why or how it came into existence. But if you look for it, you won't find any such thing. Because we seem to be ego only when we're looking away from ourselves. If we look back at ourselves, there's no such thing as ego at all. Asking why or how ego came into existence, Bhagavan often used to say, it's like asking why or how was the son of a barren woman born? There is no such thing as a son of a barren woman. There cannot be. There can never be. Likewise, this ego, it doesn't actually exist. It only seems to exist because we're looking away from ourselves. So what is the solution? Stop looking away from yourself. Look back at yourself. We can, we can go on uh, questioning all these things for all eternity. The point is, why all the Bhagavan taught us, why did Bhagavan teach us that we should always have this question in the back of our mind when we read Bhagavan's teaching? Why did he teach this? And if we understand it correctly, it is he taught us this in order to turn our attention back to ourselves. Because the only solution to all our problems is to investigate ourselves. So Raman is suggesting to us, and we've been at this street corner before in this group on Sunday yeah. morning talking about this very subject. So it sounds very much, you made a compelling case that Ramana is suggesting to us, if I understand you correctly, to do self-investigation 18 of our 24 hours every day. Because the minute we cease doing self-inquiry, the ego becomes alive and thrives in the world around us with all of its yeah. problems. That uh, is the it, ideal towards which we, uh, we should be moving is to be self-attentive throughout the waking and dream states. Of course, we are not because we still have strong vishaya vasanas. 
But the more we practice this, the weaker our Vishaya Vasanas will become and the stronger our Sat Vasana will become. So the more we will have an inclination, a liking, just to rest in ourselves, rest in our souls. And you say to do all this non-mechanically, non-ritually, uh, but slowly and intentionally, uh, the fundamental awareness of our own existence arises then. Uh, no, because... no. Our fundamental awareness of our own existence never arises. What our... arises is ego. The fundamental okay. awareness of our own existence, that is the ground, that is the, the, the adhishtana, the basis from which everything else rises. Yes, yes. I added that phrase mistakenly. Uh, what I wanted to say is, so it's not necessarily like doing japa or as a Catholic repeating the rosary, because no, that no, becomes no. after five minutes purely mechanical. Yeah, and yeah. that's not going to get me anywhere if I remind myself who I am. Yes. Anything but an intentional way. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, we can't attend to ourselves mechanically because the very nature of the mind is to go outwards. So we are, so to speak, swimming against the current. So you can't mechanically swim, swim against the current. You have to, you have to put in the necessary effort. It, it, it requires great love to be, to be hold on to self attentiveness requires great love. It's because of our lack of love that we, we are, we are not attending to ourselves all the, so, throughout the waking and dream state. So that raises the question in my mind. I don't know of anyone who's capable of 18 hours a day focusing on the I am. Uh, as, don't as, worry about other people. Are you capable of it? <laughs> you, you are capable, but you don't have a liking for it. That's a problem. It's I a have bucket. a liking for it. But no, you don't. You don't. You have to... You think you have a liking for it, but you have you still have too much liking for other things. I'm not saying about you, I'm saying about all of us. We all yeah. of us, why we are here? Because we still have liking to attend to other things. If we had so much liking, if we had liking only to attend to ourselves, the story would be finished. We'd be out of the picture. Well, that's that's a good reason to increase my practice. So thank yes, you for yeah. but that. Yeah, that's that's we, we, that's what we're all aiming for. All this talk about Bhagavan's teachings, this is only to encourage us and to clarify what we need. What is it we need to do? We just need to be as we actually are. We need to be self-attentive. That's all that is required. I know this is routine for most people, but thank you for reiterating that because I find value in it. Bhagavan's teachings, if, you, if we understand Bhagavan's teachings, he is constantly reiterating it because... This is the simple, this is all there is to Bhagavan's teachings. And so he's dinning it in again, 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 in so many ways, but it's the same thing he's saying. Attend to your, stop attending to other things, attend to yourself. That is the, that is the sum and substance of all of Bhagavan's teachings. Thank you, Michael. All these, all... That all these other teachings, if we understand them correctly, they all implying only this. Michael, speaking of practice, can I ask you a question about yeah, that? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so if I'm conducting this self-investigation, at a certain point, actually immediately it becomes clear that all the objects are not what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, the, the sounds, the thoughts, yeah. They're not just an appearance. So when I place my attention back on myself, I can't, that attention is a different kind of attention. It's, it's not an attention of a thing, but I still yeah. know that I exist. I still yeah, know yeah, that there's yeah. awareness of things. Yeah. I um, think so I, one of the best ways of expressing, of, of describing the practice is being self-attentive. That is, it, it's not that, we, that though we loosely say attending to ourselves. It is not actually, it's not a, that attending to anything else is a doing, but attending to ourself is just a state of being. We are just being self-attentive. And self-attentiveness or self-awareness is our real nature. So we are just trying to be as we actually are. So at a certain point in the inquiry, it becomes just kind of effortless. I, I guess what I'm asking, at what point does the inquiry turn into just abiding or just being? 
That is, to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to that extent are we being ourselves. That is, the, the knowing and the being are one and the same. But what is actually happening when we are, when we are practicing, our aim is, that now our attention is facing outwards, our aim is to turn our attention 180 degrees, so to speak, away from other things, back towards ourselves. But because of our, the strength of our vishaya vasanas, we are unwilling to let go of other things. So we are not able to turn the full 180 degrees. Depending on the strength of our love, our bhakti and our vairagya. Bhakti means the love to be as, to know and to be as we actually are. And vairagya means the freedom from desire to experience anything else. So according, depending on the strength of our, uh, bhakti and vairagya, we may be turning 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 90 degrees, 120 degrees. Even if we're turning 179 degrees, we still don't know ourselves as we actually are because we still have a lingering awareness of phenomena. When we turn the full 180 degrees, so to speak, we've turned our back entirely on phenomena. So we're not aware of anything other than ourselves. That state in which we are not aware of anything other than our state, ourselves, is a state of pure awareness, which is what we actually are. So as soon as we turn 180 degrees for even just one moment, that is the end of the story. Ego mm. is uh, uh, eradicated. There's no, there never was any ego then. Then that is the state of a jata in which nothing has ever happened. So somebody's in that state and they pick up this candle. Nobody is in that state. Only that is, it's not a person in that state. Now we take ourselves to be a person because we are still looking outwards. When ego is annihilated, the whole universe is annihilated with it. It seems to us, we see someone like Bhagavan and say, oh, but Bhagavan had realized himself, but he still answered questions. He still cut the vegetables. He still wrote poetry. Uh, Bhagavan said, oh, that if a body and mind of a jnani exist only in the view of the Agnani. Agnani means way. one who doesn't know. So it's only in our view that Bhagavan seems to be that person. In his view, his experience of himself is, I alone am. Okay, so he knows he's not a person. But at the same time, he also knows, would it be fair to say that the person appears to him as a dream? But no, we take it. No, no, no. Only to us. We are the dreamers. We are the ones who have dreamt Bhagavan. But Bhagavan, is, that doesn't mean that Bhagavan, that is, the, the name and form of Guru is unreal. But it has a power to bring about the real awakening. An analogy Bhagavan often used to use to illustrate this, there's a belief that elephants are so terrified of lions, if an elephant sees a lion in its dream, the shock of seeing a lion will cause it to wake up. So the, the lion is unreal, but the waking is real. Likewise, the name and form of a guru are unreal, but they bring about the real awakening. How do they bring about the real awakening? By turning our attention back within. When we turn our attention back within, then only are we really attending to the real guru, because the real guru is not that outward form, it's only I am. That's why Bhagavan often used to say, the real guru is within you, the real guru is in your own heart, cling to that guru, that guru alone will save you. So the function of the outward form of a guru is only to turn us back within. Does and, that adequately once, answer your question? I guess the last thing I was going to say, though, is, okay, once, if that has done, then the world or Maya still is seen as nothing other than pure awareness, right? Yes, but what does that mean? When you look at the snake carefully and see that it is a rope, you are seeing the snake as a rope. What does that mean? You're not seeing the snake at all. You're seeing only the rope. If we yes, so see Maya as, as ourself, we are seeing only ourself. We are not seeing Maya. But our self is one. Maya 
it is the cause of all multiplicity. Maya is our own mind. It, 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 that which projects all multiplicity. So long as we are seeing multiplicity, we are not seeing oneness. And when we see oneness, we will not see multiplicity. So Bhagavan sometimes said, yes, for, for the Jnani, the world is also real. But where, in fact, Bhagavan says explicitly in verse 18 of Uludunapati, though, that is, both for the Jnani and for the Agnani, the world is real. But whereas for the Jnani, the reality is limited to the extent of the world, that is, to the names and forms of the world, for the Jnani, the reality shines uh, devoid of form as the, as the substratum of the world. That is, okay. what appears as the world. So, we, we are seeing the same thing. That is, when we look and say, oh, that snake is real. Bhagavan said, yes, it is real. But what he is saying is real is the rope is real. So the snake is real as a rope. It's unreal as a snake. So, so long as we see the names and form, we are not seeing the reality. When we see the reality, we will not see the names and forms. That's why Bhagavan said explicitly, both in the third and fourth paragraph, but so long as we perceive the world, we are not perceiving ourselves. When we perceive ourselves, we will no longer perceive the world. Perceive ourselves means when, when we are aware of ourselves as we actually are. Obviously, ourself is not an object that we perceive. It's just a way of saying it. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, shall I, shall I just um, finish off this paragraph? Um, because there's only two more sentences. Yeah, that's good. We only have a few minutes left, so go ahead and do that. Yeah. Um, that is, as I say, in the, he, he, he had said, of all the thoughts that arise in the mind, the thought called I alone is the first thought, or the original thought, or causal thought. Only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Then in the next sentence, he says the same thing using different terms. Instead of referring to it as a thought called I, another thought, he uses the terms first person and second and third person. So in the next sentence, he says, only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. The first person here, here means ego, with that, that primal thought called I. Second and third persons means all other things. So all other thoughts, all other things or thoughts, it's the same, that all other things are just thoughts. Um, so it's only after the first person, in other words, the subject, appears, do objects appear, second and third persons appear. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. So without ego, phenomena do not exist, is what that implies. So everything is dependent on this ego. So the, whatever problem we may face, the problem, the, the root cause of that problem is our rising as ego. So what is the way to deal with problems, whatever problem may arise, whatever thing may appear to us, to whom does it appear? This is the clue he gives in the next paragraph. This is a very, very precious, very, that is, to put this into practice, this is a very precious clue Bhagavan gives us. Whatever may appear, doesn't matter what it is, to whom does it appear? That doesn't mean that we go on questioning to whom does it appear. That is that, when he says to whom does it appear, that is a pointer. That is. That, that is a clue to us how we can turn our attention back towards ourselves. It doesn't matter what appears. As he says in the next paragraph, he says, um, uh, uh, however many thoughts arise, so what? What does it matter? What is important is what vigilantly, as soon as each thought appears, if one investigates to whom it has occurred, it will be clear to me. That, that is... This, this, this question to me, it's not necessary that we go on asking this question, but this question is a clue. That is, whatever appears, it appears to whom? So any problem we face in life, to whom does it, this problem appear? If we turn our attention back towards ourselves, the problem no longer is important. We hold on to ourselves. No problems can touch us. It's only when we let go of ourselves and allow our attention to go outwards that we have so many problems. We've got to pay the bills. We've got to uh, do this. We've got to do that. We've got to get up in the morning, go to work, or, or uh, whatever it is. We've got so many. We seem to have so many responsibilities and obligations and everything. Only when we allow our attention to go away from ourselves 
So what is the solution? Don't allow your attention to go away from yourself. To whom does all, do all these problems appear? To me. Turn your attention back. So that is the practice that Bhagavan is teaching us. Whatever may appear, to whom does it appear? I have a quick question. Um, yes, what is your take on self-realization written by B.V. Narsimhan? Uh, he's written uh, an article on self-realization with uh, Ram Maharshi's help. Oh, I, I don't Narsimhan. know. Um, he, he wrote a biography of Bhagavan called Self-Realization. I didn't know he'd written an article. Um, oh, I, I guess that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, it, is it's it a biography of Hmm? Is that worth reading? What is your opinion about it? Well, if you want to know the, the story of Bhagavan's life, yes, I mean, that's the earliest biography. It's not all entirely accurate. It's the stories that he gathered at that time. Later, some of those, towards the end of his life, Bhagavan, um, Bhagavan pointed out that some of the things that were written in that biography and other biographies that they weren't actually correct. Bhagavan corrected some of these things. But for many years, Bhagavan just kept quiet. Bhagavan was least, to, because the, for Bhagavan, all this is unreal. It doesn't matter whether people say, uh, whatever people may say about him, it's all unreal. What is real is only I am. And I think that's a good place to end, Michael. We can, right. Any few questions we can save for next, uh, next yes, time you yes. join us, please? And, and I think the, the next paragraph is a particularly important paragraph, the sixth paragraph, because there Bhagavan is giving us many very, very valuable clues for, this, for the practice. So I think next time we can continue from, from the sixth paragraph onwards. That would be great. It's too bad we have to wait a full month for that to happen. <laughs> Well, we can be practicing in the meanwhile. There you go. That's good. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank so, you, Michael. Uh, yeah. uh, and like you say, with this practice, keep coming back to this. I've read this several times, but today it was just like kind of like a whole new episode in uh, Ramana's teaching. So thank you very much for being here for us today. All Bhagavan's teaching, they're all about practice. because. What is the use? You, we can. There are volumes and volumes that have been written on Advaita philosophy. You can go on studying this Advaita philosophy for any mm. number of lives. It's not going to solve the problem. Now, but what is the essence of Advaita? There is one only without a second. And what is that one only? You are that. So, what does that mean? Attend to yourself. And that's called practice, and thank you. It's meant so yeah, much to us. Yeah, yeah. Because yes. all this, that Bhagavan's teachings are very simple, but all of them, they're, they're all pointing in only one direction. Attend to yourself. That is the sum and substance of all that Bhagavan taught us. Thank you. And attending to ourselves is both investigating ourselves and surrendering ourselves.